So, Bob, I have a bunch of questions from the listeners that we are going to read and answer. What do you say? I'm wearing my pod t-shirt. You are. You're wearing a take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do t-shirt. I do. It looks great on you, by the way. Thank you. If y'all want to buy one, you can go to Teespring. We don't usually talk about merch on the audio podcast, but if you, there's a lot of merch. The pod wife, Stacy, designs all of it. And the most popular is what you're wearing right now. And I think it's a great shirt and it makes like a great it. mug. And uh, you can go to Teespring or you can hit, click on the link below. I like the colors. Yeah. it's It's got a very pleasing thing to it. And uh, none of our merch is says psychology in seattle on it it's all like kind of universal things that one might say oh. <laughs> or or just have on a t-shirt i wore this two weeks ago and two people said oh i like your shirt oh yeah yeah uh there's a number of shirts that like i there's a don't be a jerk face shirt i like that, that uh, i'll get comments on anyway uh, why are more people women why are more women diagnosed with borderline personality disorder asks listener chelsea from new hampshire hmm. She says, can you address why more women than men are diagnosed with borderline? I am a clinical mental health counseling student at Antioch in New England. Funnily enough, I listened to your podcast a lot before becoming a student. A practicing clinician mentioned to me that he believes borderline to be an anti-feminist diagnosis. And borderline itself comes out of a societal expectation placed on women. What are your thoughts on that? Bob, what do you think? Um, I think that person's onto something. I, and what I heard, I haven't thought about this in years, but what I have heard um, is that um, men with mental health troubles are going to get funneled into the prison system and women with mental health troubles are going to get funneled into the mental health system. And so that there are probably a lots and lots of people with borderline personality disorder who are not getting treated for it, who are in the prison system, um, who are prob- who are most more than likely are who are men. And so... Because it's it's because nobody's looking. It isn't because there's a difference in prevalence. Right. Yeah, just to talk about prevalence for a bit, the traditional prevalence for borderline and narcissism is you have two-thirds women, two-thirds of borderline are women, and two-thirds of narcissist personality disorder are men. Mm. But when you look at the data or the assessment methods or you know people and gender a little bit more closely – there seems to be some evidence that it's 50-50, which would make much more sense to me. Of course, we socialize children differently based on gender, but I don't think it's that pronounced, particularly for a two-year-old child, uh, that it would you know, create that much of a difference. Because that's the way I do see it, is that uh, borderline and narcissism are a product of your early defenses being translated into uh, adult. I'm noticing you have a... a, a, a a wound on your arm. Oh, yeah. I just gave blood. Uh, you gave blood. I did. Like donated. I donated blood. Oh, you're just a good person. Oh, right? well, yeah. As if bo- people didn't love Bob enough. Now, some Bob's blood is going to be pumping through someone else's veins uh, in the future, saving their lives. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wonder if you could make merch out of that, like Bob's blood. And then uh, if you had to... <laughs> If you had the same blood type, I bet you anything people would want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the uh, prevalence seems to be potentially that h- half of those uh, with borderline are uh, men and half are women. And of course, the research doesn't look into non-binary people, so it's hard to right. to know anything about how that would pan out. But um so there's that. The other thing is is that our field absolutely has a history of sexism and, miso- and misogyny, yeah. for sure. Uh, borderline has been and is still somewhat still used to uphold the patriarchy and uh, reflective of many practices in our society today that a woman will be uh, legitimately upset or oppressed and is angry yeah. or upset, and she'll get labeled as hysterical or borderline right. or crazy or a Karen or something like this. And it's like, uh, maybe she has good reasons to be upset instead of, um, you know, seeing it that way. So yeah. And borderline has been utilized in that effort to oppress women and to, uh, societally gaslit, gaslight women into believing that there's something wrong with them and not something wrong with the system for sure. 
But this whole, but this idea that borderline is anti-feminist, I don't agree with at all. I mean, the construct of borderline can be used in an anti-feminist, oppressive way. Right. In the same way that a baseball bat can be used in a violent way. But you don't just look at a baseball bat, you know, someone playing baseball on the, you know, your, your seven-year-old is playing t-ball. You don't say, I don't want my kid to play t-ball because a bat is used to harm other people. You're right. like, well... That's that doesn't mean the, there's something wrong with the sport or there's something wrong with the bat. It means yeah. there's something wrong with people using it in that way. Mm-hmm. And borderline is the same way. Yeah, the construct of borderline is a thing, and and there are a lot of people out there, particularly particularly CBT people and to some extent humanistic people, that don't believe in diagnosing at all. Solution focused people as well. And there are two branches. One is is that they they understand the constructs of psychology and are okay with it, but they just don't utilize it in their practice because they don't find it to be very helpful. Uh, that I'm fine with. But there are other people that will say that the whole idea of personality is not valid. And the whole idea of personality disorders is uh, not valid and is ridiculous, which uh, I find to be incredibly short-sighted. You're essentially throwing away 150 years of you know, the most intelligent people in our field thinking and observing and researching and saying that they're all idiots and you're somehow this genius. It it reminds me of when a- amateur astronomers will say, I figured out what dark matter is. I mean, do you know enough about as- as- astronomy and astrophysics to know anything about dark matter? I know a little bit about dark matter, but just I, that's, all, that's all I got. Yeah. Well, I, I'm... Uh, a bit of a astronomy nerd and a, my first job that I wanted to thought I would be when I grew up at when I was in grade school was I'd be an astronomer so right I, I know a little bit about dark matter and, and have for you know 25 years ish and there's this temptation for I don't know people that think that they know things and these aren't academics these are just people like me just sitting at home sort of learning about and they'll they'll somehow figure like I figured out or I figured out uh, a different answer to relativity. Yeah, that's another common thing that amateur ar- armchair astronomers will say. I figured out that relativity is wrong and Einstein was wrong and I have this new idea of the space-time continuum and all this stuff. And and it's like, well, maybe, but probably not. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I find that when... And it's, it's born on two notions. One is... I'm smarter than all the other academics that spend their entire lives researching this and studying it and learning the actual data. Me just sitting at home, I work at my regular job, and then at night I watch like you know PBS documentaries on string theory, and I think I understand things. Right. Um, it's akin to that. It's like you're a therapist and you studied a little bit in graduate school, and you just decided that personality disorders aren't a thing. And I'm like, uh, what? So I don't know if that's where this person is coming from. Yeah. I would have to talk to him. But to say that borderline is anti is an anti-feminist diagnosis, uh, you know, in its entirety, <laughs> you know, because that'd be like, anyway, point is, is yeah. Now, it, are there people... So I don't want to bifurcate between like good diagnosing and bad diagnosis because there's definitely like a gray zone in the middle where you can have people who are using the construct of borderline in a responsible way, but because of their bias against women, they will uh, be biased against women in this way. You know, like you have, a, for an example, a woman comes in to see me, but I'll just use myself. A woman comes in to see me and I'm assessing her and over, you know, five, 10 sessions, I start beginning to wonder if she is a, candidate for the conceptualization of borderline personality disorder and her anger because i've you know um, internalized a lot of the messages about women being hysterical or angry women or nasty women as trump would put it um uh or assertive women or nasty women Mm -hmm. is actually a better way to put it in terms of what he was saying you know that nasty hillary with her assertiveness and wanting to have health care for people anyway so this sort of thing and uh, I've internalized that. And so as this woman client starts to get angry about her husband, say, I might 
have this knee-jerk reaction to, to categorize her anger as hysterical or borderline or unreasonable or distasteful somehow or over the top. Um, when, yes, she might be a candidate for borderline personality sort of conceptualization, but she also might also legitimately have anger at her husband, which is totally fine. And so in that gray zone, even though I'm on board with the borderline construct and, and even though um, I try not to be sexist, it's hard not to filter things through the internalized sexism that we all have. Yeah. So in that way, I might kind of extend the borderline construct to include all of her anger instead of just the triggered trauma anger. And in that way, I'm enacting a sexist, misogynistic, patriarchal um, uh, crime, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so anyway, um, so yeah. The, the other thing is, is that, uh, well, any thoughts on that, Bob? Anything can be used as a tool to bash somebody over the head. I think if we're not using, if we're if we're conceiving people in such a way as to pathologize or make them alien, then we're not using this stuff the way it's intended to be used. You see that a lot with people. They they so if if you're not looking at somebody through the lens of compassion, then chances are you're missing the boat. Yeah, and if you're not aware of your internalized biases, yeah. then you'll also miss the boat. Yes, agreed. Uh, but have you heard that accusation that borderline is an anti-feminist or a misogynistic construct? No. And when I said earlier, when I said, yeah, what I was thinking was anything can be used as a tool. Any any baseball bat can be used to whack someone over the head. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that um, that the information about personality disorder in this case is to be ignored. Right. Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you're treating somebody, you you have a conception of whether you want to use di the, the, di the DSM diagnostic or whatever stuff you, I don't care, but you're, you're going to be treating them. You're going to have a theoretical framework under which that you're going to be looking at them. I was in a training once, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 years ago or whatever. And the, the, I was really frustrated because the other participants in the training were throwing out, Narcissism was the one that they happened to be talking about that day um, as, you know, because it's pathologizing or because and I, I said, look, this is a baby in bathwater thing here. There might be some use and utility in seeing some in this way because you don't have to reinvent a wheel. Right. right? Which is cool, actually. And um, I was outvoted. Wait, they were saying that the concept of narcissism is what? Inherently um, flawed because it is a label as opposed to you know like shit if i had cancer i definitely want him to get the right label right right yeah i've heard this many times too and i find that th similarly to you when that argument gets proposed the group will not feel i don't feel comfortable pushing back on it because mm. I, I i'm pretty sure i'm going to get outvoted as well because we just have this well, so I, this is what happens. We observe human beings, my dog is barking, and you think, and then over time, people start to develop language around like how to conceptualize them. And they're like, oh, there seems to be this category of people. They're not all the same, obviously, but they seem to have a similar problem of narcissism where they brag a lot. They think that they're superior to other people. It interferes with their life. They have underlying insecurities. They are very sensitive to criticism. They seem pretty focused on how to make other people know that they're on top or they're better or something. And yeah, I have a difficulty with, with empathy. And so I think, you know, I think they all kind of fit together. I think we'll label it narcissism, you know, narcissistic personality sort of. And then it gets used for decades in its very technical field and no one outside of the industry hears about it. Then over time, outside the industry, maybe people inside the industry start using it as a as a cudgel of like that person has narcissistic personality disorder, that politician has narcissistic personality, that celebrity has narcissistic. You had my ex husband has narcissistic, and it's not in a compassionate mm -hmm. or 
uh, clinical sense, it's in a angry, yeah. um, hurtful sense, yeah. or a you know, a, what do you call it? Like a vindictive sense. Yeah. It's a it's an indictment. The label is an indictment. Yeah. When in the beginning, it was just a description right. based on observation. Remember, anal retentive. People were calling everybody anal right. retentive. That was actually a Freudian developmental stage. Right. That actually had some meaning. Who knows? Right. I don't know if it's real or not. But we started tossing it around in the pop culture, and now it no longer. Right. Well, was, I, I mean, I know a little bit about it. It. He believed that we go through an anal phase in which we will, and it's an observation of, and it is true that kids will go through a phase where they're very focused on very few sensations that they are aware of, yeah. you know? And one of the sensations that they're aware of is when they are um, going number one or number two. Yeah. And so, and there's a pleasure involved in that that I think many of us can relate to because it seems that we evolved to want to go number two when we have to go, you know, there, it yeah. would make sense that we would have some pleasure in we would evolve to have some pleasure in doing that right. to encourage us to do it right to encourage us to when we feel the need right do it and then it it's satisfying it right, feels right. like oh you got, you know. relief right and the and children have that as well because you need to have some conscious uh effort you it doesn't happen naturally there's certain things that happen in your uh all the things that happen in your intestines are that happen. you know the yeah. muscles that push yeah. everything out yeah. happen involuntarily but right. the final step you have to agree <laughs> generally you have to say okay let's do this some thing. participation is necessary yeah. yeah it's on autopilot it, you know it's sort of like uh when you're in the air you could it's autopilot but when when you land there's some <laughs> there's some pilot participation at that, <laughs> that final step i like our metaphor yeah uh now we just kind of everyone's imagining like a 747 kind of coming, <laughs> coming out of your butt i really love our metaphor now. yeah <laughs> but anyway so um as a child, when th things are going well, the child will develop a healthy mm -hmm. sense of their anus and their going number two. They will uh, feel like it's okay mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. It's okay to take some pleasure in it mm -hmm. in terms of some satisfaction. There's nothing shameful about it. There, you're not dirty. Mm -hmm. You're not disgusting. Mm -hmm. And what Freud observed, and it's not universal, but I'm, I'm quite sure that he saw at least some kids or adults that had histories of this. They would, as children, be shamed mm -hmm. or they would have some sort of internal complex around uh, sharing their insides with the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of kids don't think the way adults do. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they think, in, you know, it's a it's a different experience because they don't they don't know all our cultural associations. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. For some of those kids, maybe a relational experience or an internal experience, will retain this or will have a, uh, the developmental phase of the anal phase will become complicated in such a way that a personality complex will persist into their adulthood that makes them very shameful or focused on uncleanliness or on sharing themselves with other people or on letting their inside experiences, sharing those inside experiences with other people. And those are people we call anal retentive because they developed this retention of their body and their emotions and their experience uh, because of their wanting to retain their excrement because they felt ashamed of it or dirty or something when they were young. Um, is there empirical evidence of this? Not really. It'd be hard to demonstrate because you'd have to <laughs> ask a six month old child yeah. what their experience is really like. Sure. And we don't really have we don't that. Really, really. Um, and yeah, but it entered the pop culture as someone who's controlling. That's how we think of that person's anal anal retentive because they have a controlling, you know, so you can use anything to bash somebody over the head with, you right. can use that. You can use narcissism. You can, right. So, is it the tool or is it the person holding it? Is it a club or is it a baseball bat? Right. So then over time, as it becomes the cudgel, right. then people start, uh, clinicians in the know start saying, hey, that's not fair. Right. You can't just, in a vindictive indictment, say, you're narcissistic. My client right. is borderline. Yeah. I don't want to treat her because right. she's borderline. She's, right. you know, and because they're unsophisticated in my opinion 
they just say, well, let's just get rid of borderline. Yeah. It's a misogynistic idea. Right. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we see a crime on the street where someone beats someone with a baseball bat. And they're like, well, let's get, let's get rid of baseball. No. no that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You, but if you've never seen baseball and you don't like baseball or you don't understand baseball and you see someone being beaten by a baseball bat, then you go get rid of the baseball bat. Sure. But so if you don't understand personality disorders or you don't understand how to use them mm -hmm. or you've never seen them used in a way mm -hmm. that makes sense to you or helpful to you, then when you see being personality disorders being used in a harmful way, then you say, let's just throw it away. Right. Which is um, ignorant. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, I'll see students in their fourth quarter at Antioch and they will have decided that psychodynamic theory is stupid mm. or personality disorders don't make any sense mm. and thus need to be like thrown out and i'm just like the arrogance mm. like you're in your first or second year of graduate mm. school you you think you can throw away 150 years of research uh -huh. and literature uh -huh. and uh helpfulness uh -huh. There's a reason why we talk about Freud. There's a reason why we uh -huh. talk about psychodynamic therapy. There's a reason why we talk about personality disorders. Yeah. And you've cracked the code uh -huh. in your second year and, and, yeah. and you want to throw it all away. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, my goodness. I don't have any problem with someone wants to change the name. You want to switch. Like I heard Marshall Linehan say that she thought that what we call borderline personality disorder ought to be called something about emotion dysregulation. Total. Well, Marsha and I don't agree on the central concept i don't know why but i would call and we've talked about this before i would call it a abandonment trauma ptsd or something something yeah. or betrayal trauma yeah. maybe even more specifically she might agree okay don't know because emotional regulation is a product uh because you wouldn't call a veteran from war who comes back and has a lot of emotional issues right. you wouldn't say he has an emotional regulation problem you know you'd say he has war trauma that right. results in emotional yeah but that's anyone who simple. is traumatized will have emotional regulation yeah. problems you yeah, know yeah. What I mean? yeah. but i think marcia given her model or the way she thinks she thinks. really focuses on the emotional regulation, which is a good thing dbt yeah. is a wonderful thing but sure. it doesn't solve the underlying as we've talked about no no right. in terms of the corrective experience around right. um betrayal or abandonment or right. attachment disruption well, she would she would i believe talks about that stuff too as ideological okay she calls it biopsychosocial theory um that's like your biology your psychology and your environment are all going to coalesce and create right. yeah <laughs> so in the nice i remember we would talk about that a lot because mm -hmm. we we're trying to be more holistic right right and that like the dsm-4 with the five axes and all that stuff oh right yeah and they're like because in the beginning it was all about psychology and they're like well you have to think about the societal yeah. part of or the environmental family relationships right. so that's the bio or that's the psychosocial right and like well you got to think about biology right bio psychosocial right and then you got to add culture so bio psychosocial cultural oh yeah <laughs> right and and you know like that's it's I think we're just becoming more sophisticated in our capacity to observe and describe that which happens. Yeah. And that's all what a diagnosis is for is to right. encapsulate what happens. Right. Right. And as you're saying, it doesn't matter what you call it. And no. I don't when I th treat people with borderline, I never I almost never think the word borderline. Yeah. What I think is being abused as a child or and the trauma that comes from that right. or the schemas around I am unlovable or right. the schemas around there it is. I'm being abandoned. Right. That person is, I think criticizing me. So right. this is the beginning of the end. I might as well just pack it in and I'm going to let them have it because I can't believe that they're going to reject me over that little stupid thing that I did yesterday, even though none of that is actually happening. I don't think borderline. I just think schemas and yeah. traumas yeah, and yeah. past and, you know, so Yeah. And if we want to change the word, fine. Yeah. Um, as long as we can all agree, I don't think it should just be done haphazardly. No. I think histrionic personality disorder should be changed. Probably change that. Because <laughs> yeah. that has a really right. silly history. Uh, 
Because, you know, like avoidant personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, you know, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, these aren't, these are, these make sense. They're descriptive. Right. Borderline, histrionic. It's like, why do they call it that? They, they, they make less, they're less descriptive of right. the thing and more, perhaps say more about the observer than the observed. And the language system that it's, it exists, you know, yeah. Freud and Breuer and all them had a word called hyster hysteria hysteria yeah. and it was applied right sort of weirdly anyway yeah uh all right let's take a break bob when we get yep. back i have an email just for you oh right on hey deserving listeners as y'all know i am constantly recommending that people go to therapy we all need therapy from time to time well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy, and you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today. All right, we're back from the break. So this email just came in today from Alexis. Uh, Remember, we were talking about Alexis last episode. Or a hi, couple, Alexis. A couple episodes ago. Yep. She, she says, hi, Kirk and Bob. I'm just listening to the la latest episode. It was hilarious to relive that moment. So just chiming mm. in, Bob and I were talking about when Alexis flew in from, I, don't, I can't remember where she flew in from for our live show. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you were on stage and you mm -hmm. asked for volunteers. She mm -hmm. came up on, this, up on the stage during our live show. And yep. it went, it was kind of awkward. Yeah. Um, I'm just listening to the latest episode. It was hilarious to relive that moment from the live show. I feel bad that Bob still feels bad about it. <laughs> Please let him know I often tell that story when I talk to people about the live show. More as a funny anecdote about my awkwardness over not thinking to push back. <laughs> <laughs> I found that moment really funny even then, and especially now. I still love all the members of the Piss team so much and very... Much appreciate, Bob. Mm. Y'all bring Thank such, you. such nuanced and interesting perspectives to your listeners' lives. Yeah. So, just Thank thought. you. That's <laughs> lovely to hear. All right. Patron Destry, he says, could you talk about how to be a better listener? I'm curious on how to be a better listener. Bob, you're the best listener I've ever met, so oh. please educate everyone. Be quiet. If you want to listen, stop talking. Yeah. That's the main thing. Um, maybe you're going to ask a question or two, but be curious about who's the asker is the asker one who wants to elicit information or is the asker one who wants to influence um, the direction of things be quiet it's not that hard if you're willing to be quiet it's not hard to listen yeah and then and then be willing to be uncomfortable what because do you mean? people are going to talk about stuff that maybe you can't relate to um or maybe is gonna rub you the wrong way or um, maybe you won't agree with um, it's hard to maintain interest and curiosity when somebody is saying something that you really um, disagree with. And I, listen, I'm, I'm not always listening, let's be clear. Nobody should be, so I'm not either. And there are times when um, I could do well to slow down and pay attention. That's something I, I work pretty hard at. I, I spend a lot of energy consciously becoming more adept at listening. And People are fascinating. They're just really fascinating. Right. And they tell you a lot if you just slow down and be still. Like, and and uh, me, the last, what, year or so, I've been, like, not just using my ears to listen, but using my eyes and um, um, become um, more and more sensitive to word choice and tone because a lot of what the message is is going to be embedded not in the words, um, well, some of the words, but but even people are, people can answer questions in the most shrewd way. They can thread the needle. They say the most fascinating things without saying them. And so, in couple therapy, I've been, I, I occasionally will ask a question, and I'll hear something, and I can't think of an example of this. And I'll say, well, that was a very shrewd response, 
because what it was was this really delicate managing of what it might otherwise be a conflicted situation and people are good at answering without telling the full truth and it's there for us um, to learn about if if we want if we slow down and listen and we pay attention so that's really what you got to do is you got to pay attention and um, always with the attitude of interest and curiosity, not, not with like a lawyerly attitude where you want to get someone. I'm going to get you. I'm going to. I'm going to nail you down. And it's like, hey, why, why? I don't want to nail anybody down. I'm kind of fascinated by what they have to say, um, and what they aren't saying in the way that they're saying. Because when someone doesn't say something, they're actually telling you a lot about themselves. So in, in a shrewd response, I might be learning about shame. I might be learning about fear. Um, I might be learning about anger or maybe the way somebody feels about being angry. Um, it's, it's served up. It's, their people are really good at telling us their story. Right. Even when they don't tell us the story, it's there. And boy, are they just amazing. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good inspiration for me too, to mm. be reminded for me of the um, the curiosity they have about yeah. other people. I, I remember yeah. before I was a therapist, this is one of the things that kind of fell into place when I suddenly thought about becoming a therapist. There are all these things that fit. I thought, wow, there's a lot of vectors pointing me to becoming a therapist. And now that I'm thinking about becoming a therapist, all these things make sense to me. And one of them was that from an early, maybe 15 on, I was always asking people these really in-depth questions like mm -hmm. at parties or something mm -hmm. and found people just to be fascinating uh -huh. and also found small talk to be really boring. <laughs> and people would say to me sometimes that I would get them to say things yeah. that, not that as a power play, but just as a, I guess I'm just interested or something. You offered an invitation. Yeah. And qu which I would add another tip to listeners is starting off a good listening session, I guess, a good conversation, sometimes requires you to uh, broach the topic. So I was with my family recently, mm -hmm. and um, my sister-in-law, her mom, had a really awful accident. And has been recovering and i uh, i'm quite positive that she my sister-in-law has been thinking about her mom a lot lately and worrying about her mom and i wondered if anyone had asked her about that you know because it's it's a sensitive topic and mm -hmm. you know sister-in-laws they're not like central to the family if it was my sister she'd get probably asked more questions you know sometimes in-laws don't get paid attention to and so yeah so i i always try to ask people that you know like if i'm if i was going through something like that mm -hmm. i'd want someone to ask mm -hmm. and i also wouldn't want to bring it up because i wouldn't want to bother people with it uh, or if i was mm -hmm. going through a medical problem mm -hmm. or something kind of scary like that or a, or a move for example or a job change or something or a breakup it you don't want to bother other generally people don't want to bother other people but if someone asks then it all comes pouring out right and so i i, I every time i see my sister-in-law i always ask her about her mom mm -hmm. even though it's not i don't know her mom that well and so it's not really i'm not personally curious about it you know i'm not like personally interested well i'm interested but how do i put this my life isn't that impacted by what happens with my sister-in-law's mother mm. so it's not it's not a personal curiosity of mine other than that it, my sister-in-law matters to me and so i i care about what she's going through and right. you know and so that's another part of listening is is to ask those questions and you do that as well bob like mm. you you ask these questions that i don't know if you intuit this but you know what is on my mind and I probably won't bring it up. And so you ask about it. Things that are maybe a little bit more difficult to talk about, I guess. Mm -hmm. You do that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another thing to do with listening, which I will talk about with my trainees a lot, is phenomenological listening. Bracketing is what they would call it in the old days. And you 
there are two concepts, two general concepts of phenomenological listening that I find to be useful to me. One is that you want to try to put aside your belief system while you're listening to someone. Don't try to filter everything through the your your linguistic system. The other thing is to really try to get at what the person is trying to tell you and understand their experience. So, for example, if someone says, uh, like you're asking about new job, someone said, someone says, uh, well, yeah, my new job, it's, uh, it's really interesting and I'm finding that it's challenging and I, uh, you know, I'm sort of getting to know everyone. So if I heard that from someone and I filtered it through my own lens, I would draw conclusions on what interesting meant, what challenging meant and so on. But we don't know what the other person means by challenging or interesting. We don't know that. And so that's part of that phenomenological listening is like, assume you don't know what they mean by that. You, you might have, it's like the topics or it's a, the title of the book, you know, like a thousand pieces or whatever, you know, right. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. If you just read the, the title of the book, we all understand that you don't really, you don't know anything, you know, maybe maybe something you know harry potter the sorcerer's stone okay there's a sorcerer's stone in there maybe it's about kind of magic stuff harry potter it's about a guy named harry um of course to read the whole book is to understand the book and similarly when someone says my job is interesting or challenging you have the title of the book you do not have the mm-hmm. text and so you have to ask someone what do you mean by challenging mm-hmm. or how is it challenging mm-hmm. or how are things challenging to you what does a challenging job mean to you what are, what are your life goals? Now, maybe you don't go fully into that if you're at a party or something, you're just talking about your job. But, but if you really want to be a good listener is to assume that you do not really understand what they're telling you and they're giving you the title of the book and to just keep asking questions. What's challenging about it? Do you like it that it's challenging? Is How do you feel when you think of when it's challenging? Is it Does it feel good or bad? You know, all those kinds of um, and the last thing I'll say about listening that we haven't mentioned yet is to be genuine. Mm-hmm. This is um, uh, something I try to teach my trainees as well. They always struggle with this in the beginning because they're trying to be a therapist mm-hmm. and they're not being genuine. Is when you're listening is to be you. And I know that sounds really weird. How can you not be you? But spontaneous, authentic, genuine, in the moment, not in your head, not overthinking it. You know, you can overthink listening. People can, and novice therapists always do overthink. It's like, I'm listening right now. I'm listening. How can I listen better? You know, uh, that is going to interfere with the vibe you give off to the other person. They're going to feel that. It's a distancing effect. And so you want to be in contact. You want to be free to really listen. Now, it might require some practice with the things we've talked about so that you know, it's sort of getting back to our baseball <laughs> metaphor. If you're, uh, it, you know, in the batter's box, you don't want to have to think about how to hit the ball. You you need it to be automatic. Right. And so that requires a lot of practicing, yeah. repetition. And then you can get to the batter's box and the crowd's, you know, going crazy right. and it's high stakes. The bases are loaded, bottom of the ninth, and you got to hit it out of the park. You know, it's, it's, two, it's three and two. Mm-hmm. You got two outs. You got one chance to win the game. You can't. You can't be thinking about how am I going to swing this uh-huh. bat, or where do I put my foot, or right. how much energy do I put in with my shoulder? Yeah. How you know? How do I keep my eye on the ball? Um, you can't do that. You have to. It's repetition, and so yeah. listening is something that you become proficient at by practicing. In my yeah. experience, you have to do it. You have to be intentional about it in the beginning, and then eventually you can become natural, and then you're in contact and in the now and genuine with people. Uh, Next question. Patron Kristen from Minneapolis says, what advice do you have for us everyday people when it comes to being a good listener and question asker? It's a similar question. Um, No, no, wait. No, this is a different question. Yeah. Um, Where should one draw the line between being a good friend versus being an unqualified substitute for a therapist? So it's a different kind of spin on this question. In addition to wanting to be a good friend, I'm a high school teacher and so many of my students aren't able to see a therapist. But even though I don't have the skills, I do have the desire and capacity to want to help my students when they struggle by listening to them. 
So where can you draw the line between being a, a good listener versus being an unqualified, unqualified therapist? Any tips or advice would be greatly appreciated. Bob, what do you think? Well, you have to operate within your own limits. And the thing about limits is it's hard to know what they are until you cross them. So um, I don't know that I, this is an interesting question. Like, how do I know where the limits of my job as teacher begin and end? You know, because I'm not just an imparter of academic knowledge. Part of my job is to nurture uh, my students' learning. And part of that has to do with, you know, what are the things that are getting in the way of their learning? Mm-hmm. And so as, and as a, just a fellow human on the planet, it's like, oh, I see you, I see your suffering. So um, uh, probably a good idea would be to draw from the wisdom of colleagues who have been around the block a time or two to get um, uh, guidance about what are the limitations um, in my particular role for you know, um, where to um, recommend that somebody seek counsel elsewhere or where to um, let somebody know that um, what they're talking about is beyond my scope or my limit or, um, and also to be willing to deal with um, the bumps and frustration that might come up. Like if, if, if I hit a limit, I remember this happened to me once when I was in college I had a really good friend, someone who I really depended on, and it was finals week, and I was in the middle of some kind of personal crisis. I can't remember what it was. And she had school, and she said to me, I have 10 minutes. And I remember feeling really frustrated with her. But the truth is, is she had 10 minutes. That was what she had to give because she had other priorities. And just because I'm in crisis doesn't mean that she should be and have to drop everything Um and I, for, I remember when that happened, I felt ashamed and angry. And in reflection um, since, I'm like, well, yeah, she had limits because that's people. So, so recognizing what are yours um, is really important. Um, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Sometimes I end that way too. So they'd be like, oh, hit a wall. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what I'll add to it is you're asking, you know, how do I avoid being an unqualified substitute for a therapist? And I think that this is based on some paranoia, maybe because therapists have said s- such things that have made people paranoid. Oh. You know, I, I know some therapists that'll be like, you can't, you know, you're not a qualified therapist. You can't, you can't do that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. it's like, some a teacher can't listen to her students. Yeah, right. A teacher can't ask how are you doing. Yeah. If a kid is crying, the teacher can't listen. This is not a therapist. This is being a human being. It's being mm-hmm. a teacher. Yep. So it might because you have special knowledge, or it kind of looks like therapy. Uh, it can it can look like therapy and not be therapy. You know, yeah. when I have a, a trainee and we spend an hour of supervision and she's talking about her childhood traumas and we don't talk about her clients at all. If someone watched it, they would assume, especially given the fact that I'm a therapist, that this is a client. Right. Just because it looks like therapy doesn't mean it is therapy. No. And so the it's easy to avoid. Uh, avoid clinical advice. For example, like you should take meds or you should take this supplement or you should do this or that. Uh, if you avo- you know, if your students come to you and say, I'm dealing with low self-esteem and you listen and maybe you provide your own tips. You know, when I was your age, I had low self-esteem too. And this is what I did. Uh, I'm not saying this is what you should do, but, uh, and as long as you think it's safe advice, you know, it's not something that is unusual Mm -hmm. in advice, you know, something like uh, try to focus on the things that you're good at or, let me point out some things that I see in you that mm-hmm. you could focus on yourself mm-hmm. or you might want to think about pushing back when people, well, you might want to avoid that kind of advice. But anyway, it's easy to avoid uh, uh, more dangerous areas as a listener if mm-hmm. you're in that role. Um, and refer, you know, if, if someone seems like they're suicidal or something yeah. like that and you don't know what to do because you're not a trained you're not trained to deal with that then refer i will say that some teachers are trained and you mm-hmm. can be on how to approach suicidality mm-hmm. in students 
So it doesn't mean that you can't become, you know, proficient in, in that role. Yeah. Um, they would never be the, the clinician, but they would know how to detect and refer and support and that kind yeah. of thing. And honestly, the world needs more teachers like you, uh, mm. uh, Kristen in Minneapolis is you're doing a lot and you're doing more than you need to do. And because you care. And like I said, the world needs more people like you right now. Uh, all right. Well, that does it for that episode of psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>